Welcome everyone back to my channel where I talk about the strange and unusual and a big part of that is true crime. I've been fascinated with true crime ever since I was little and if you will share my obsession, this is the place for you. Welcome. And what I love about true crime is that even when you know all of the cases and you feel like you're really into the community, there's always a new case that you stumble upon that just blows your mind. You can't even imagine it. You're like, where has this been? And that's what happened with Amy Bishop's case. I don't know how I missed it when it happened in 2010, and I've never heard about it since. And it might just be me. I might have just missed it, but it's so fascinating. The more and more I read about it, I go, how does this woman who is a wife, a mother, a college professor, just one day snap and open fire on her colleagues? And it's so interesting because she doesn't fit the image I had in my head of a mass shooter. I mean, she's a teacher, someone you think is there to help you. And then she's also a woman, which overwhelmingly mass shooters are men, which just makes her case all the more fascinating. And Amy Bishop is defined by one day, one event in her life. But the more and more you look back on her story, it makes a lot of sense. It doesn't seem like she just snapped. It seems like there were events leading up to this day that if people had paid attention to, if people had treated differently, maybe the story I'm about to tell you wouldn't exist. Amy Bishop grew up in Braintree, Massachusetts, and there wasn't a lot of information, at least that I could find, on her childhood, but it seemed relatively stable and that Amy was a high achiever in school. She would go on to get her undergraduate at Northeastern University in Boston and her PhD in genetics at Harvard University. In 1989, she would marry James Anderson and go on to have four children together. And in 2003, she joined the faculty at the University of Alabama at Huntsville in the Department of Biological Sciences. And she would remain there until the shooting. But it wasn't like she lived such a normal life that nobody noticed any signs, any warnings. They did. Actually, a lot of people did. They just didn't really do anything about it. Students noticed her bizarre behavior. They would say she would get angry really easily. And then also that she wasn't a very good teacher. They even made complaints about her to the administration. Some signed a petition about her, yet no changes were made. Her faculty also noticed. Colleagues said she was a bit erratic and that she would interrupt meetings and go on bizarre tangents. One colleague even called her, quote, crazy. And that's important because he was on her tenure review committee and Bishop was denied tenure. And when Bishop learned what that colleague said about her, she filed a complaint with the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission alleging gender discrimination. But the professor who said the remarks didn't back down. He said, quote, I said she was crazy multiple times, and I stand by that. This woman has a pattern of erratic behavior. She did things that weren't normal. She was out of touch with reality, end quote. And it wasn't just people within the school who noticed. People outside of school had signs too. She was in a writing club, and apparently Bishop saw writing as her way out of teaching. But someone inside that club said she unofficially wrote, or didn't publish three books. And one of those books was about a female scientist who was fighting a potentially pandemic virus, all the while battling suicidal thoughts brought on by potentially not receiving tenure, which relates a lot to Bishop's life because in March of 2009, she was denied tenure. And even though she appealed that ruling, they denied her again. So she was pretty distraught over that. It sounds like she wasn't looking for another job. She really thought they were eventually just going to give it to her, I guess. But by March 2010, her teaching contract was expected to be up because she hadn't gotten tenure. And this is important because on February 12, 2010, that's the date of the shooting. 
Bishop went to school like it was a normal day. She taught two classes and then went to a regular faculty meeting and stayed there quietly for about 30 to 40 minutes until the meeting was almost over at four o'clock when she got up and brought out a nine millimeter handgun. And she just started shooting people. She started from who was closest to her and worked her way down very systematically. It wasn't chaotic. A witness even said it was execution style. And no one could escape because Bishop was blocking the only exit. And then she went to shoot the dean of the university's undergraduate program, also someone who had denied Bishop's tenure. And that's when the gun jammed. And the people inside the room took this as an opportunity to get Bishop outside and lock her out. And all of this rampage, all of this carnage was over in just a minute. But it was devastating. And Bishop almost acted like it didn't happen. She went to the bathroom, threw away the gun and her bloody clothes, and she walked outside of the building, expecting her husband, who she had told earlier, to pick her up as if she thought she was just going to go home, like it was a normal day, like she hadn't just done what she had done. And of course, she was arrested right outside the building. And a short while later, witnesses reported hearing her say, quote, it didn't happen, there's no way, there's no way, they're still alive, end quote. But on that day, three people lost their lives and three others were injured. It turns out she didn't even have a concealed weapons license and the gun wasn't hers, it was her husband's. And in the weeks prior to the shooting, he had brought her to a shooting range. And when news of the story broke, it brought in a lot more information on Amy Bishop and revealed that this wasn't even her first violent outburst or the first time she had killed somebody. And all of these warning signs were right there. Like in 2002, when she punched a woman in the head at a Peabody, Massachusetts IHOP because she had taken the last booster seat. And she was screaming profanities at this lady and saying, quote, I am Dr. Amy Bishop. And in, in a 1993 incident where Bishop and her husband were suspects in a letter bomb case, Paul Rosenberg was a Harvard Medical School professor and a doctor who was Bishop's advisor, and he received a package containing two pipe bombs that failed to explode. And Bishop had allegedly been concerned about receiving a negative evaluation from Rosenberg and reportedly was in a dispute with Rosenberg. And at one point during the investigation, the couple just flat out refused to cooperate with authorities. And then a little after the bombing, Amy resigned. And to this day, no one's been charged and the case remains unsolved. And then the biggest warning sign of all, Amy Bishop killed her brother. She shot him. And if you're thinking, oh, well, maybe it was an accident. Accidents happen. That's so true. Accidents do happen. But how old are you imagining them being? When I first read this, I thought, oh, they're children. But it happened on December 6, 1986, when her brother was 18 years old and Amy was 21 years old. She was already in college, had already met the man she would marry. These were not children, and I don't think this was an accident. And what is known is that she fired at least three shots from her father's shotgun, one into her bedroom wall, one into the ceiling, and then one into her brother's chest when they were in the kitchen with their mother. And as the Brain Jade police rushed to the shooting scene, Bishop ran from the house towards a nearby car dealership. And when she was there, she demanded that they give her a car at gunpoint. But eventually the police showed up and she was taken into custody. But Amy only spent 20 minutes in that police station before being released back into her parents' custody. And all of this was ruled an accident which is super suspicious. And this is when the story really starts to spiral because years later, police chief Frazier, who wasn't the police chief at the time of Amy's shooting, but would be once the news story broke in 2010. So he's speaking on these um, years later, he wasn't present, but he said that classifying 
it as an accident was inaccurate. And he spoke to police officers who were present in 1986, and they said that the police chief then, John Polio, had personally met with Amy Bishop's mom, who they knew each other, and Amy Bishop's mom was on the town committee and had convinced the chief to classify it as an accident and not charge Amy, but rather have her be released back into her mother's custody. And then by 1988, the records of the shooting had mysteriously disappeared. Frazier said on February 13th, 2010, that, quote, the report's gone, removed from the files, unquote. But then on February 16th, 2010, it was announced that the files had been located and they were turned over to Norfolk County prosecutors, whose district attorney, William Keating, concluded from the files that probable cause existed to arrest and charge Amy Bishop for her crimes in 1986 committed after she fled the house. She could have been charged with assault with a dangerous weapon, carrying a dangerous weapon, and possession of ammunition, but by this time, the statute of limitations was already expired. But she was still going to be charged for her new murders. And on February 15th, 2010, Bishop was charged with one count of capital murder and three counts of attempted murder. And on June 16th, 2010, nearly 24 years after shooting her brother, Amy Bishop was charged with first degree murder in her brother's case. And just two days later, she attempted suicide, but she survived and was later sentenced to life without the possibility of parole after pleading guilty to killing her colleagues. And they decided not to prosecute her for her brother's case because she was already spending the rest of her life behind bars. And that is the wild story of Amy Bishop. And if you would like to hear more stories like this, please subscribe to my channel. There'll be many, many more.